So if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to continue on the Sermon of the Mount and con um, lining that up with the spiritual disciplines. So Matthew chapter 6. I'll be reading from verse 5. It says, whenever you pray, be sincere and not like the pretenders who love the attention they receive while praying before others in the meetings and on street corners. Believe me, they've already received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your inmost chamber and be alone with Father God, praying to Him in secret. And your Father, who sees all you do, will reward you openly. Verse 7. When you pray... There is no need to repeat empty phrases, praying like the Gentiles do, for they expect God to hear them because of their many words. There is no need to imitate them, since your Father already knows that you, what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our beloved Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth, just as it is in heaven. Verse 11, we acknowledge you as our provider of all we need each day. Forgive us the wrongs we've done, as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Rescue us every time we face tribulation, and set us free from evil, for you are the King who rules with power and glory forever. Amen. Verse 14. And when you pray, make sure you forgive the faults of others so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you withhold forgiveness from others, your Father withholds forgiveness from you. Where is Jesus sitting when he's saying these things? On a mountainside. On a mountainside. He's still sitting. He's still outdoors with the crowd. They're all... This, you've got to hear his tone here. He's a, a, a teacher with the crowd around him. He's sitting at, the, at, at his feet on the ground, marveling at the birds in the sky, sitting on the ground, seeing each other. It's, it's a casual setting. It's a comfortable setting. So his tone is not, but ah, but ah, you guys, and this is how. He's teaching them from a place of, of gentleness, a place of this is his passion. So we hear Jesus teaching here on prayer. Let's see, this thing is doing its own thing. So the big question is really, what is prayer? So I've got quite a few definitions or assumptions on the screen. It says the word in the scripture for prayer have various definitions. It's to ask, to fall to one's knees or to kneel down. If the scripture says somebody does that, then you know they're in prayer. It's to worship, to knock, to intercede, to meet, to turn, petition, intercede, plead, request, beg, supplication. There's so many words to replace just our one word, it's prayer. Okay. So our term, uh, another term for prayer is often praise or thanksgiving. It's another form of praying. When you read those words in the Bible, you know it's discussing prayer. But it's also important that we need to have an inner posture. Because remember the Beatitudes was Jesus teaching them this is the heart orientation of people in God's kingdom. His kingdom rule, this is our heart. And so in prayer, he's continuing with that same heart posture that we just learned about yesterday. And he's saying our inner prayer posture. Again, I'm saying inner because sometimes we think, oh, should I hold my hands like this? Um, should I be on my knees in front of my bed like I see these little kitty prayers? Or should I look up and lift my hands? Am I supposed to close my eyes? And we get so confused with some of these postures that we don't focus on what is the inner posture that Jesus is trying to teach us here. And so it's an inner posture of thanksgiving and praise, of humility, that we need to surrender our agendas to God, knowing that we need Him. That's where the humility comes in. Our inner posture of is a desire to commune with and to receive from God. So it's a slower pause. It's not just, oh, God, please give me a parking spot. And, and God, I'm late for this. Please let them also be late so I don't look so bad. It's so much more those, than those prayers. The inner posture, number four, is it involves placing yourself in the position of allowing your mind to be renewed through testing and to activate the mind of Christ. 
So I've got all those scriptures. I'm sure you guys took your little screenshots there. Um, and number five, another inner posture is quieting. Psalm 46, some of us spoke about that one yesterday in our private conversations. Be still and know that I am God. That's a part of our inner posture during our prayer. So what prayer is, it is a con thank you. It's a connective bi-directional communication with God that, de that deepens our experiential relationship with Him. It's bi-directional because it's me speaking to God. What is on my heart? What is my concern? What are my fears? What are my joys? But part of prayer is also listening to God, which brings back, I think, um, Quentin, I think you mentioned yes about having a notepad ready. That's a big part of having that with your prayer. It's not journaling, but it is, it's, it's jotting down while I'm praying. What is the Holy Spirit putting on my heart mm -hmm. that later on I can meditate on, later on I can elaborate, but during prayer, I'm also listening out for God. I'm not just talking and talking and talking. Okay. Um, prayer and fasting, as we've looked in the scriptures here, we'll see it later on again with fasting. Jesus says, when you pray, when you fast. He doesn't say, if you pray, or if you're going to fast. He's saying when, because what that means is he's assuming it's part of being a Christian. Yeah. It's part of having a relationship with him. It's a normal, assumed action is prayer and so we got to also see that what jesus did here he says if you pr don't pray like the hypocrites that's quite a strong word but sometimes we're not quite sure what that word meant in their time what the hypocrites did is they prayed to bring glory to themselves that they were not desiring to bring glory to god in their prayer time so it was an outward thing now culturally it was a good thing to to show your emotions so if people were going through a rough time, they'll throw ashes on their head and they'll, they'll mourn outwardly so people understand. And that was a good cultural thing. It was not a bad thing. But then the Pharisees started twisting that, that when they started praying, it had to be elaborate as well so people can notice, see, this is what I'm doing. And the same happened with fasting. So Jesus was calling them out as hypocrites. And so the real question is, what is a hypocrite? Now here's one. I'm a hypocrite. Yesterday, I'm standing here teaching guys, let your little light shine. You know, we go out and we're shining lights. And I'm driving on the highway and my car lights are on because it's raining. And then this truck just swerved in front of me. And I just at that stage my, made my little light shine way brighter. <laughs> I flashed the dims or the brights at him thinking, oh, kingdom people, this guy just so angry, he did not see a Christian right now. It's like this and we fall into our hypocrisy. And I think that's what we've got to understand. We sometimes think, oh, those Pharisees were the hypocrites. You know, but in their time, the word hypocrite, really, or upocrite is the, ex, um, the pronunciation, I think, that it's got the meaning of a pretender. Somebody who's acting or pretending. It's a play actor. So the common conception today is that it means saying one thing and doing another thing. So it's not practicing what you preach, it's what we understand hypocrite. But that was a way that they described actors. Now, again, if you really think about it, actors are hypocrites because it's not themselves. But we wouldn't call an uh, actor a hypocrite today because that sounds just too harsh. But that is the implication of a hypocrite. It's an actor, somebody who acts a different part. And so the inner use of this term of hypocrite in the book of Matthew especially, he has a very strong emphasis on the inner relationship with God versus the outward actions. And that's why he's using this word hypocrite. He used it here in Matthew 15. He uses it again um, about the, the Corban and acting like hypocrites. So we'll see this word used by Matthew. He's really strong talking about this pretending. So the inward nature of hypocrisy desires not to glorify God. It desires for me to be on show, for other people to notice me. So you have to at some stage pause and ask yourself, is, my heart, is it my heart to glorify God? or to glorify myself when I pray. You know how often we walk past people and say, oh, I'll pray for you. But do we? And you see somebody who says, oh, I know they're going through a rough time. And say, oh, I prayed for you. But you didn't pray for them, you know. So I think we can so quickly fall into that ourselves. Um, and again, Jesus says, do not pray to be seen by men. So we need to crucify that heart attitude of loving to be seen by other people. And honestly, if that is where you are at spiritually, at this stage, then maybe you need to just force yourself to pray in secret. Mm -hmm. Don't let your roommates see you're praying. Don't let your spouse know that you're praying. Just go pray in secret. Mm 
They'll have a prayer time and nobody know that. That might be a good inner change of heart for you. And also, Jesus says, do not approach God with meaningless or repetitive words like the Gentiles, as we read it now. So I know you were trying to follow along in your Bible. I was reading from the Passion Translation, TPT. <laughs> so that's why it didn't sound like in your Bible. And I think at times it's very important for us to change up the, even the translations. So we're so used to NIV and ESV, and they're brilliant. But just a different angle sometimes bring another another ring to it like so the tpt the, t the passion translation is not a word for word translation but it, it has implication and it softens the words to my language that i can understand what it was saying and so he's talking about do not babble do not talk meaningless words like those gentiles okay and so the greek word is but but legio but legio i listened to it this morning okay <laughs> which really means speaking without thinking haven't some of us fallen into that i have so often to another person and now to my holy father that i can even speak without thinking god what am i really saying to you because then i've lost connection with him then i'm going through the ritual of just praying so again ask yourself at times am i now babbling in my prayer or am i still connecting am i still seeking the presence of my holy father and I listen and I speak to him. And so our hearts and our in, in prayer is that while Jesus is talking about not, not repeating repetitive, he's not saying that all repetitive you know, um, conversation is wrong because what did he do? He prayed three times for the same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane. So he's not talking about don't repeat and, and all these words. He's saying have your heart in that conversation. And if you three times need to beg God on the same conversation it's because you're in that conversation it's not a mindless babble that you're going through and then jesus gives us a full example of how to pray in chapter in chapter 6 verse 9 to 15 which we just read he says this is then how you should pray now remember he's sitting there on the side of the mountain people are all around him the kids are playing and chasing butterflies and everyone's like oh. it's like let me tell you how to do this so that's a bit of an excitement, like, wow, we're going to get a practical? He's going to guide us here? And he's saying, this is how you should pray. He, at this stage, is not saying this is the exact words. Some of us are a li little bit more to the, give me a box, give me a tick, and that. And then we want to imitate the exact words. And we don't feel our prayers are fulfilled if it's not the exact words. He's saying, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying these exact words. He's talking about the heart behind our prayers. This is how we should pray. And he's saying how, not what, so that we can see there's so much room in my own personal conversation with God. And he starts off with saying, our Father. I don't think we get how deep that is. Because we grew up with God is our Father. We grew up in that religion. But for the Jews, you did not find that ever in the Old Testament. They, they would not call God our Father. I mean, He's too holy. He's God up there. He's way, he's way too holy and too respectful for to, to call him my Father. How dare you? Jesus changed all of that this moment. So here these people are sitting on the side of the mountain. Their kiddies are running and Jesus is talking about prayer. And he says, guys, let's pray our Father. And suddenly the crowd's like, what? Our Father? That's new to them. And we miss that newness because we just, you know, of course, we've learned the Our Father since we were young. The Our Father is a little, a little thing we say, you know. But it was revolutionary to these guys on the side of the mountain. Now they're orientating the God up there to, he becomes personal. He's Our Father. But the other thing that's really amazing is that Jesus is not saying, Father up in heaven. Jesus says, guys, as I teach you here, Let's say our Father, mine and yours. Jesus is immediately pulling them into his friendship, into his fa family. And he's saying, God is both ours. He's mine and he's yours. That he's emphasizing the relationship that we get to have with Jesus. So next time when you sing or pray our Father, it's you and Jesus' Father you're talking about. That's how personal and amazing prayer was to them. And then he says, hallowed be your name. To have a heart of respect for who God is, which is represented by his name. His name is holy. And therefore we do need to, 
to make sure that we are respectful as we speak to God, whatever the inner respect would be in your own heart. He says, let your kingdom come. Now, kingdom in Matthew really means the rule of God, the realm of God. I think Paul touched quite a bit on that yesterday as well in his class, that the kingdom of God is where God rules. And so Matthew is saying, let your rule come here. He is requesting that God's rule be extended over the whole earth. That includes God rule in my life. Rule in my family's life, rule in our church, rule in my neighborhood, in my country, in this world. We see such a broken world. We're so focused on there's a war in Russia and Ukraine, which is horrible and true. But there's so many other wars we don't even list and know about. And I'm talking wars in countries. I'm not even talking about the inner war. There's so much war going on. God, let your kingdom rule in all those places. He says, give us today our daily bread. We need to see ourselves as dependent on God. That he wants us to ask him for our needs. He cares for us. He says, I love you, but just ask me. I know what you need, but I want to connect with you, that you know it's me giving it to you. It's not just, oh, lucky me, look what happened. No, it's, wow, bless me, my father answered and gave me this. The fifth point, he says, forgive us as we forgive others <laughs> okay that can often be a lot of a, a challenge for us because we know we need forgiveness daily but if you just pause for a moment you think about yesterday what did you need forgiveness for when you knelt on your knees or however you prayed before you got into bed what did you ask forgiveness for because again it becomes like the our father prayer it's a rhyme we know, and then oh God forgive us our sins. And by the way, forgive everybody's sins, and everybody in prison, bless them, and help the sick, and amen, and I'm going to sleep now. It's sad how even as Christians, we fall back into those little rhymey stuff, where we, we say, I'm a sinner, and I need forgiveness, but do I still remember what I need forgiveness from? Oh, I walked away from my sins today, and I knew exactly what I needed forgiveness from. It's 32 years later. Do I still know what I need forgiveness from? Because it's not those things anymore. I have sinned a whole lot different and more even now. You walk away from a really great discipling time and your discipling partner was faithful and courageous enough to say, I need to speak up. I'm noticing something in your life. And I just feel like if I don't bring it up, I won't be a godly friend. So let me bring it up. I've seen this way you speak to your husband. There's, there's a pride in your eyes. Or I've heard the way you correct your son or... In your case, you know, when you just blatantly just kind of snuff that person in, 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 in fellowship and just, I see you being sensitive and rude. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what I've noticed. Wow. And you feel like, that's true. It's true. It's true. Thank you for godly friends, Father. Help me be a godly friend to somebody else. But then I walk away and I'm like, no, I need forgiveness. Not, oh, I'm such a sinner. Of course you are. Surprise. We all are. But I need forgiveness for my pride. I need forgiveness for how rude I was when I go to God for it. Doesn't that make the Our Father prayer so much more real now? Because we need forgiveness. And he also says we also have to realize that God will not forgive us if we don't forgive others. Now, again, I don't think he's a spiteful, like, therefore I won't. I don't think it's you forgive, I forgive. It's not an exchange transaction. It's a general, how dare I go to him and say, Father, please forgive me for being so rude to this truck driver on the road. But, uh, by the way... <laughs> You know, I was really rude to the dog or to my kid this morning, and ugh, they could just get over it. We sometimes minimize our side, and we're not willing to forgive others. Is there somebody that you've not forgiven? Do you just get quiet and go into your closet or your meditation room or just driving in the car? It was one of my blessings driving here just about an hour and ten minutes of absolute silence. You get a lot to hear and listen to the spirit to just, and we've got to create those spaces for ourselves. And when you go into one of those silent spaces, does the Holy Spirit put a nudge like, yes, you, that, that person still annoys you? Or that one, you, you just think too much negative about that person. Maybe there's a need for forgiveness. So this prayer is so much wider than a little rhyme we need to pray. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. <laughs> we need God's protection. Um, because he's the only one who can deliver us. He's really the only one who can save us. Now, again, that's one um, way to pray in, 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 with, with our hearts, how to pray. 
But there's so many other forms of prayer. So Paul yesterday mentioned about the Jesus prayer. Did anybody get a chance to go Google and figure out what's this Jesus prayer? Okay, well, the challenge is still on, then I'm also not telling you. So <laughs> it was very popular amongst quite a few of the, the monks, the monastic period. Go Google it. It's, it's one of those things that'll feel a bit woo-woo and airy fairy and ri- rubbing your ear kind of, that's that category. But it brought spiritual depth for people where I wish I could reach their spiritual depth. Maybe I should imitate some of their spiritual disciplines. And so that's yet another way to pray. Another form of prayer is called the breath prayer. Anybody familiar with that? You are? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. So, a few of us. So, for those of you who are not familiar with breath prayer, the whole goal is, again, quieting my soul. Um, and then as you take a breath in, you say something that connects you to God. And you just re- re- draw in really slow and keep it there. And as you breathe out, you say something else. So, for me, on my in-breath, A lot of times I will say, shepherd of my soul, help me hear your voice. And that'll be my breath prayer. And I will say that four, five, six times over, just getting me to focus on God. A lot of times before church, that's a good thing for me to do. Because I hear the people, I hear the needs, I I see the things that's wrong and that bothers me, and I don't hear his voice. I'm in fellowship, God. I'm here in service of you, but I'm here as a fellow worshiper. Help me hear your voice. When I go into a counseling situation that I'm not quite sure, am I even getting what this is about? Shepherd of my soul, help me hear your voice. Another one that I use every now and again is two of Jesus' names. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace. When I feel stressed or uncertain or insecure, that's my breath prayer. And I honestly, what I told you guys, you put on that fake smile, what that does to your brain is, I'm actually okay. That muscles trigger my brain to say, I'm safe, I'm okay. Our anxiety will take over, so I smile and, shepherd of my soul, help me hear your voice. Or, wonderful counselor, prince, Whatever are your words, and even if it's one word, you connect a word to God for you. And it's seasonal. Next time it'll be something different. But you know how you connect to God. That's called breath prayer. There's something called centering prayer. Another form of prayer. Again, slightly longer, but it also starts calming you with a bit of breath. And then you're centering your prayer on a specific verse. And you just pray through that verse. Be still and know that I am God. Another great one is Psalm 23. And so you find scriptures and you pray through them. Another form of prayer is song prayer. I would know we've got some really gifted song lead singing people, and we've got some non-singing people. And I can sing even though I'm not qualified because I'm in my own kitchen when I do it. I drive in the car when I do it. So nobody has to hear me, and God knows I am tone deaf and I don't sing well. But sometimes singing connects me to God. So sing a prayer. Another form of, of praying is praying through the Psalms. Praying through all the prayers in the Bible. Nehemiah's prayer, Mary's prayer, Hannah's prayer. There's so many prayers. That when you pray through them for a whole month, just pray the Bible prayers and not my own. What would that do to me? How many more prayers will I discover as I go through the Bible, seeking other people's, godly people's prayers and praying them? Okay? So I said what else, but I know we are also running out of time. There's a few different ways of prayer. So my question is, what is one change that you are willing to incorporate this week to intentionally make space for prayer or to improve your prayer life in some way? Because I know if I ask now, have we all arrived? None of us will say, I've arrived at prayer. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so full and perfect on prayer. We all have something that's like, oh, I can grow in this. Don't just walk away from Sassam and say, oh, there was so much work. It's true. But what are you taking into your week that you can say, there's one intentional thing that I can do? When we talk about fasting, what comes to mind for you? Not eating. Not eating? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're fasting something for a purpose to get closer to God, not necessarily food only is what you're saying. Pain and suffering. <laughs> Let the honesty roll. <laughs> for most of us, that's not a voluntary thing. We just walk and say, oh, I can't wait to fast. Okay. 
Okay. It is, however, a spiritual discipline. Okay. What happens with disciplines? You've got to practice them. They don't just flow on your path and there you go down the river of fasting. It's a discipline and you, f and you work at it. And so Richard Foster, again, the guy that we bring up quite a lot, he's written a number of books and resources on spiritual disciplines. He says more than any other discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. For some of us, food is the thing that controls us. And that's, I, I would say for most of us, food is important anyway. But I do want to put a disclaimer right at the beginning connecting to what Shakira was saying. If you do have health issues, it is wise because wisdom is part of everything we do as Christians. And so wisdom comes in that, let's say I do have a, an eating disorder. I struggle with an eating disorder. Fasting might not be the spiritual discipline that God expects me to practice because it might feed the wrong things in me. And it might disconnect me from God instead of connect me to God. So medical reasons are very important. Some people for health reasons need specific medication at specific times. It's unwise to take your medication on an empty stomach for three days because I was going to really fast. Mm -hmm. Folly is a sin. Mm -hmm. And so that, the wisdom is important in that. Um, so yeah, the definition that we have for fasting is the voluntary abstinence of some or all caloric foods and beverages for therapeutic which is health or spiritual or political reasons have you heard of guys on a hunger strike that's fasting fasting can be manipulative it can be to take a stand fasting in that sense can be in solidarity with a group that you are supporting a purpose that's political fasting it's abstaining for a very purpose to make a very strong stand. Okay. Fasting can also be very therapeutic in the sense of for health. Have you heard, guys heard of intermittent fasting? Yeah. It's a buzzword and it's potentially good for many of us. <laughs> okay. But actually a solid water fast has so many medical benefits. Many strong athletes, they work in a number of fasting days before they compete because of the incredible health benefits that you get from total fasting. You can actually reset your whole immune system with three to four days of autophag autophagy, which is 100% pure water fast, nothing else. You cannot take a vitamin, not a supplement. You can reset your whole immune system, okay? If you fast, a water fast, for 16 hours or more, you create new brain cells. That's one of the health benefits of intermittent fasting. Your energy picks up after that fast. You think, oh, I'm going to be like this because my mind said I need food, so I'm really tired. So there's incredible health benefits from fasting. Over the years, you go look at the health benefits of um, uh, scientific, uh, scientific magazines, you'll be overwhelmed. So there's therapeutic um, benefits. There's political reasons. But as Christians, even though we might also at times engage in those, when we engage in a Christian fast, it's for connection to God. It's a spiritual discipline. So on the days I just fast for the sake of health, that doesn't count as a spiritual fast because, oh, by the way, I haven't eaten. It's like five hours into the day. Maybe I can just as well fast today. Yeah. That's not fasting. You didn't start it off connecting to God. You just neglected eating. <laughs> and now, by the way, I'm already halfway through the day, so it's kind of convenient. I can count. No. Okay. Can you see how we can miss or misuse this sometimes? Um, so I want to give us some examples from the Bible on people who fasted. Moses fasted how many days? 40 days. That's why Jesus also did it 40 days in the New Testament. He's the, the, the typology and the Christology and all that beautiful words of Moses and Jesus. Okay. So Moses fasted in Exodus 34 verse 28. The Israelites fasted as a nation. Before some of their miraculous victories, God called the whole nation to fast. Daniel fasted in order to receive guidance from God. Okay. Now, interesting what um, I think Quentin mentioned earlier, fasting is not always just from food. One of the things, if you look later on in Daniel, I think chapter 10, he fasted from, from lotion on his body. 
Now, obviously, that must have been important in his culture that he would, in the Bible, say, I also didn't use, you know, anything on my skin. So let's laugh at that. But you know what? That might be a sister fasting makeup. And we could think, oh, how petty, how vain. But that could do such a thing because maybe, maybe her outward image was her sin. And if you hear a sister fast makeup, don't, don't mock that. Don't tease her for that. Don't look at her how vain. God, say, wow, this is really, she's seeking sin. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we trivialize people's things. And so for David to say, oh, sorry, Daniel to say, I didn't have body lotion. I'm like, okay, there's more to fast. I remember as a single, I'll, often I would fast my bed. I would sleep on the fo- floor for three, four, five days. And I didn't make it camping, e- camping easy with a camping mattress on the hard, cold floor because I just needed to be humble again. Pride is a big thing in my life. Maybe you might notice it. And so I need to humble myself. So on a cold, hard floor, just connecting to God just understanding my position before him again. I have many times fasted food. Um, I, I did a, a, a liquid fast, so I, I, f- I had food, uh, water and juice for 10 days for God to prepare me for a husband. Because honestly, it was getting a bit frustrating and discouraging. Justin and I were leading the, Cape, the church in Cape Town. We were singles. And at that stage, we started doing marriage counseling for all our friends. And we're two singles, not dating. We're friends. <laughs> everybody's getting married around us and everybody's finding a spouse and 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 I'm not and I went into my pity parties and feel sorry for myself and then I look around the fellowship and I honestly don't see a brother that could be and I thought well, maybe they not the problem maybe I'm the problem so I'm like okay God 10 days 10 days water fast prepare me for marriage if you want me to be married married marriage is not everything and again, I want to apologize on behalf of all the married who's ever teased any single about why aren't you getting married, when are you getting married. Marriage is not everything. Marriage is not for everybody. Mm-hmm. But if that is where God puts you, I said, God, prepare me to be a wife of somebody that I will be his, pa- his suitable helper to get us to heaven. And prepare my husband. If he's not in the kingdom, please go find him and convert him so long and give me patience. And if he is already in the kingdom, open my eyes at the right time. But it was 10 days. And you know what happened after 10 days? Nothing. Nothing Nothing for another six, seven, eight, nine months. But I knew I put my request before God in in fasting. And it was hard. And it just, it it inner inner transformed me with no direct outcome. So anyway, Daniel fasted his body lotions. Um, Nehemiah fasted before beginning a major building project. You are on the verge of major decisions, many of you right now. Am I going to continue into the ministry? I'm going to go back to my country. Is this my country? Um, I'm going to date that one I like or not. Am I going to listen to my parents and go continue? Start? I don't know what, to, but many of us, this life phase, you are on the brink of major building projects in your own life. Make fasting a spiritual discipline that helps you in this decision making. Jesus, of course, fasted many times during his victory over the temptation. Again, 40 days in Luke. The first century Christians, they fasted during many decision-making times. Acts chapter 13, the whole church fasted before they sent for them off. So there's many examples in scripture about fasting. In Matthew 16, verse 24, a verse I think we know from a different translation, a verse we know from Luke, talks about if you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself. Carry a cross also. And maybe that's what fasting feels like too, but part of a characteristic of Christians is to deny yourself. And so now fasting just makes sense. That, yeah, I feel like it's suffering, but suffering is good because we're all going to go through suffering anyway, so it just fits into, in order to follow Jesus, I need to also be looking at places, where should I be denying myself? And just a fast is a good place at times to to deny yourself. Okay. So in Jesus' days, the Pharisees fasted every Monday and every Thursday. Twice a week, that's a given culture, that's when the Pharisees fasted. So just for a note, therefore the Christians never fasted on Mondays or Thursdays. They never did because they didn't want to be associated or connected to the pharisaical fasting. So a, a lot of their fast would have been on, I think it's a, th- a, a Tuesday and a Friday or one of those, but it's definitely Monday and Thursdays they wouldn't because they would, didn't want to be associated with the Pharisees. So how often and which days do you fast as a when you fast, not if you fast? That really challenged me because for many years it was a when I fast. <laughs> when the church announced we have a corporate fast, people, I'll be joining. But if they haven't announced it in a while or they haven't announced a Daniel fast, 
I just go my merry way because the church leaders didn't tell me when to stop eating. <laughs> Can you see it doesn't make sense? But it was convenient because it's not a spiritual discipline that's a favorite of mine. Now, you asked me yesterday which one of mine, and now it is. Fasting has become one of my favorite disciplines because I've seen the value in that. By nature, I'm a prideful and a controlling person, and a lot of my pride comes out in controlling, controlling everything and everybody else around me, which I never succeed at, but I keep on trying. And it's wrong. And so fasting allows me to give up that control. <laughs> I don't have control over the food. I don't have control over the vehicle. And because I'm a housewife, well, I'm, I'm a wife and <laughs> I've got kids, I still cook every day. On the days I fast, I can't just say, well, sorry, family, I'm fasting, good luck. <laughs> I fast, we set the table with my placemat at the same table. I sit with my family during the whole meal. I have my glass of water with them. I participate in conversation. I am part of the family. My spiritual discipline is not going to affect or inconvenience them. It's what I need. And I'm not a hypocrite about it. They know every Monday I fast. I've been fasting for the last seven years every Monday. Now, if the church then happens to put another fast on a Thursday or a Wednesday, then I join that as well. That's for a different purpose. My fasting is I need to connect to God. My control needs to be in check every week before my Lord because it's out of control most of the week if I don't connect to God. So you find your way and your rhythm. And I think what's interesting, though, that's why I put this in here, is that in the Western culture, now I do think some of this might connect to African culture as well, it's a common idea that daily food intake should be divided into how many meals? Three a day. Did you go to school and they said, breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Did your mom tell you you can't go to school on an empty stomach? We've heard those things. We see the TV ads, huge for breakfast, this for lunch. And so we're just so indoctrinated. Three meals a day is the standard. Now, somebody's making money off that, all the cereal companies and all the bread companies. But what is important is to understand that's a recent thing. The ancient Romans, now we're talking, ancient Romans include the Spartans and some of these really strong guys, okay? The ancient Romans had only one substantial meal a day. And that was usually around four o'clock. And they believed that eating more than once a day was unhealthy. Okay, so later the monastic rules influenced common people's eating behaviors because the term for breakfast means break the night's fast. Break fast, that's where breakfast comes from. Okay, so that kind of changed people's behavior and they started eating after their night of, of prayer and their night of devotion. We just start eating after a night of sleep. Okay, that's not how it was introduced, it was a spiritual thing and they broke the spiritual moment with God into a meal. So you can see how modern world just twisted things to a more convenient. So, so dinner is a current form of timing, um, uh, uh, in its current form became popular after the widespread use of artificial light. It's only the last couple of, what, hundred or so years that we have artificial light. Before that, nobody had dinner. It was dark, you go to bed. <laughs> Circadian rhythm works. The sun is down, you're down. Sun is up, you're up. Sun's down, animals are in the house, sleep. Then came artificial light. Oh, now we can, fill, uh, we can chat later. Because I'm up, now I'm getting hungry. Oh, well, now that we're up and hungry, and we suddenly have the salt that preserved the meat, now we have a fridge root, let's go grab something from the fridge and let's introduce dinner. And so it evolved so quickly, and we think it's a have to. We think we need to, okay? And so humans increasingly ate more food and more regular at times. And that's why today we think, oh, fasting is horrible, I'm really struggling. Mm. I want to encourage you, you can get back to this. COVID was good for our family. We were together learning, well, in this one instance, it was good for our family. Um, because all five of us were at home the whole time, we switched our main meal from dinner, which it always used to be, to lunch. And so we have a huge meal for lunch. Now, because I'm vegan, the whole plate is plant-based and then I cook meat for my family. So the four of them were eating meat and plant. I have at least 10 different veggies on my plate every lunch, and I have it huge. And so it's incredibly filling. So then we discovered intermittent fasting for the medical reasons, not for spiritual reasons. <laughs> so now we started intermittent fasting. So we wake up and then we about, I'll have a cup of coffee with no milk or nothing. 
And then around one o'clock, we have a huge meal. As a family, we sit down and we feast on this meal. Not debaucherous, and it's just bulk. That's the meal of the day. We don't eat again until tomorrow. I couldn't believe we could do that. But it was all through health and, and for, for, for health purposes and science. And then I read this and thought, oh my goodness, God, that's why my body did adjust to this. I never thought my body could. But it could because you designed me like that. I'm not challenging your eating habits. I'm saying your body can do more than what you think. Mm -hmm. And your submission to God through d laying down food could create a lot more closeness and victory than what you might think you're at risk. Again, Jesus says, when you fast, and we shouldn't be like hypocrites. And so Dallas Willard says, the discipline of secrecy will help us break the human opinion over our souls and our actions. And that's why a secret fast is so much better. I don't go around telling people, oh, by the way, I'm fasting. There is, okay, so for the last eight years, I fasted every Monday, except if it was Christmas Day or one of my own family member's birthday. That was the only times I was not fasting. But then I'll fast with Tuesday. Because that fast would have been interfering with the family rhythm. It's Christmas, everybody's eating, I've cooked, and now, sorry guys, I'm not eating. That wouldn't go down as, well. Wow, we're connecting and respecting where you're at with God. So again, wisdom is important in what we're doing. Okay, so we cannot use this discipline of fasting to manipulate God into doing our will. How do we sometimes do that? Have you heard? Let me fast until you do it, and if you don't do it, ugh. I think I should stop fasting, but I'm still relying on you to hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, some of us have heard similar things. Maybe we've said it ourselves. I definitely have been there too, Eden. Let me just fast about this. And because I fasted, and that becomes a frame of, well, I've already fasted about this, and that created an extra expectation. Mm -hmm. And so really part of that was me manipulating God in my own mind. So fasting moves God, but it is not manipulation of God. As we see the people did in Isaiah 58. If you read that passage on true fasting, go read it slow and then you'll see how they were focusing on the misuse of the practice of fasting. The people were angry at God for not blessing them and for not blessing their fasts, not giving them healing and leading them to healing. They charged God with injustice and partiality. Huh? While you fast, you blame God for these things? We look at it and say, oh, that's so twisted. But where have we been in our fasting? If and when we have fasted. Okay. They missed the heart of fasting as God intended it, which was righteous action must accompany a loving heart orientation towards him by sharing food with the hungry. So when you fast, do you still have something? Now, I'm not sure about your context, but in South Africa, we have a lot of poor people on nearly every street corner. We have a lot of poor people passing by, ringing the doorbell, still needing food. On the days I fast, I should still have food available to hand out because I know I'm going down that road. I know I'm going to encounter a need. Do I then say, well, you fast because I fast? Mm -hmm. Fasting is still giving and sharing your food. And it's sometimes deliberately taking this meal that I was going to eat and giving it deliberately to a person who's hungry. Fasting while remaining, uh, while remaining involved in unjust acts will not result in God's favor. I, I, if you read this passage, it talks about how you hit each other with fists. You're like, yeah, okay, that doesn't sound really cool. So I want you to go read the passage and hear that it's actually the misuse of fasting. Okay. So purposes of fasting includes various ones. First of all, is to indicate self-humiliation before God, like the, in Jonah, when the king proclaimed a fast, even for the people, the animals, everybody was fasting, is self-humiliation before God. Fasting is sometimes for a special petition before God because I do need help, God. I do need you to focus on me. But it's not so that you do it. It's so that I can acknowledge how much I need you. It's for Christian self-discipline, and it's being able to share food with the hungry. So what we need to know is that fasting must forever center on God. The physical benefits, the success in our prayers, the enduring with power, the spiritual insights, these must never replace God. The result of your fasting, amen, it drew you closer to God, but it is about God and not about how long you stayed without food or how often you gave up this or that. So that's fasting. 